um, in West Yorkshire. And um, I grew up with uh, my mum and dad and two younger brothers. And at the age of six, uh, my mum um, and my dad had a massive falling out and my dad left the family home. So he uh, upped and left and my mum took that pretty hard. Uh, she began to drink. She became uh, an alcoholic. She would often um, be found in pubs um, drinking while I was at school with my brothers. I would often take my brothers to school and then after I would go into town and go around the pub systematically looking for my mum to get the house keys so I could take my brothers home, feed them, put them to bed. And then my mum would come home later drunk and I would feed her and put her to bed. That was everyday life for me and for my brothers. And I took on a lot of responsibility as a young kid. Um, because of my mum's drinking and because of just the nature of, of what that did to her, she would often leave us with people on weekends who would babysit for us. They would sometimes be friends of my mum's or, or family members. And one of those was an older cousin of mine, a male older cousin. And when I was around the age of seven or eight years old, whenever he babysat for us, um, he would do some pretty uh, horrific things to me uh, sexually. And that was um, a really dark time in my life as a, as a young man. Um, I became quite placid. Um, I became aggressive at times. I would flip from being a really calm kid to a really angry kid um, at the drop of a hat. And my grades were suffering. Um, my schoolwork was suffering. Teachers could tell there was something going on. Um, and throughout this time in my life, my grandmother, uh, my mum's mum, I would stay with her on a Friday night. She was a devout Catholic woman. She was really into uh, church on Sundays, baptism. She had more pictures of Mary around her house than she had of her own kids. Um, and uh, so she, she would look after me on a Friday night. And she really was my mother figure. She would invest in me. She would buy me books about the human body, bugs, dinosaurs, all this kind of stuff. And she would always pray for me. And um, that really was like my first kind of foray into faith and into Christianity and, and what, what that was like. So she would pray for me. And then on a Saturday, I'd go home back to this this really horrific situation at home. So the abuse had been continuing and my mother's drinking got worse. And um, around about the age of eight, I decided to tell my mum what had been happening with, with my cousin. And um, luckily she believed me. And I know of stories that I've heard from people where that's not been the case, but my mum believed me. The police got involved and um, it went to court and he was found guilty and went to prison. Um, when that happened, it became public knowledge what had been happening to me. Social services were now involved with the family. And um, when I returned to school after a break, um, I started getting bullied. And kids were calling me names like bum boy and they were attacking me on the way home from school. And um, I became a victim again, even in that scenario. And that followed me from primary school to secondary school. Um, and so I learned how to fight. Um, I just had to defend myself. And so I started scrapping and getting in fist fights and getting in trouble at school and got to the age of 14, 15. And um, my mum came home drunk and decided that I'm old enough now to look after myself. And she threw me out on the streets. Um, so I'm at 15 years of age and I find myself living in a skip at the back of Curry's, um, one of these big metal skips with a lid on it. And um, it was full of cardboard and polystyrene. And again, just a dark, dark time. And, and I, I often had nightmares about this period of my life because when I was inside that skip, kids would come by and play football. And so they would kick the ball against the side of the skip while I was inside it. And every time that ball hit, it just thundered. And I feared for my life. I didn't want to be found. I didn't want them to know that I was there. What would they do if they found me? Would I be hurt? Would I be attacked? Um, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. And eventually when I got to the age of 16, um, I managed to find through the council um, a, a hostel in Bradford. So I moved from Keithley to Bradford to a, to a homeless hostel called Bradford Foyer. Um, and you would think that, OK, I've got a roof over my head now. Things are going to start improving. Well, actually, the homeless hostel was full of people who were aggressive and violent and they were into drugs and people were self-harming. And it was another one of those environments where it was kind of kill or be killed and if you can't stand up for yourself then they're going to take everything they can from you my room was robbed multiple times and um, I ended up getting into again quite a few fights 
And all I wanted to do was to get out of there. All I wanted to do was get a job, find my own place, kind of get my life back on track. And then I came into contact with a group of people from a local church who were coming in on a Tuesday and a Wednesday night, and they were teaching us how to cook meals. So they were teaching us how to make corned beef ash and um, spaghetti bolognese and all this kind of stuff. So I was learning from these guys how to cook. And all they did was encourage me. They didn't have anything negative to say. They just encouraged me. And again, this thread of, oh, would you like us to pray for you? Oh, my nan used to pray for me. Yeah, sure. Not a problem. And so they, so they would pray for me. And then I would go back to this rough situation. I eventually found a job and was able to get enough money to find my own place and move out. It took a couple of years, two years, I think it was, that I was there for. Um, and uh, I had a partner at this point. I got myself a girlfriend and everything seemed to be going really well, I thought. Um, but what was going on really internally was I was still struggling to find my identity, who I was, you know, having a job was great but actually I struggled keeping jobs so I would bounce from job to job to job and I started racking up some debts and um, started struggling with managing a household and paying the bills and all this kind of stuff again this is all alien to me no one had ever taught me how to how to run a household um, and so I kind of bounced around through this and the girl I was with we decided one day to come over to Bradford to get some piercings and um I've got a bit of metal in my face. I've got one in my eyebrow and, and some other some other things. Um, and when we came to Bradford, we just bumped into this couple and they knew my partner uh, and they were like really happy to see each other. And they invited us back to their house to kind of hang out and drink some beers, play some video games. And we became really good friends with this couple. So every other weekend we'd travel over and we'd stay over the night. And again, this thread comes back through. So one Sunday morning they said to us, um, oh you know since you've stayed over do you fancy coming to church with us before you go home and i was like uh yeah sure not a problem yeah like, let's let's go to church again reminded of, of my grandmother and these guys at the hostel and just being like oh you know there'll be there'll be an organ there'll be pews there'll be there'll be a vicar and all this stuff um i better do, get ready to do communion maybe i should uh you know spray a bit of deodorant on so i don't smell too bad <laughs> and um we rocked up to this church. It's St. John's Church in Bradford on Whitfield Road. And um, it looked like a Catholic church from outside. But when we got inside, there was a live band and there was open seating and there was space for people to dance. There were kids running around. There was hot coffee as you came in. There was biscuits. And everyone just seemed really happy and joyful and happy to see me. And, I, you know, these are total strangers to me. And they said, oh, hi, nice to meet you. What's your name? And so I was kind of, blown away a bit by this what's going on and so we went into the to the main hall and I sat on the second row didn't sit on the front row I thought I'll sit on the second row I don't want people to to think I'm too eager too keen and um the worship started and so the live band's playing and they're singing these songs about love um and so I'm singing away and just trying not to sing too loud just just enough so people see my mouth moving and um Next thing I know, I find myself kind of struggling with this emotion, this I'm starting to blubber a little bit. I'm starting to kind of, there's a tear strolling down my face and, and I'm like, my heart is wrenching. I'm, I'm like, what is going on? What, what is happening? And I found myself just blubbering during this song. I just, my heart was ripped open and I couldn't, I couldn't control it. I'm trying to suck it in. It's just like, oh, I'm a hard man, hard men don't cry. And here I am just blubbering at this song about love. And after the service, um, I got myself back together and this guy came over to me and uh, he was like, oh, hey, I saw you crying during the worship. And I was like, nah, you, uh, you didn't see me crying, mate. That was, nah, you didn't see me crying. I, I was sweating. I ran up the hill. I wasn't crying. That's not what you saw. He's like, no, no, I saw you crying. You were, you were a blubbering mess, mate. I saw you crying. Let me tell you why you were crying. And uh, I was like, okay, I'll entertain you. Um, but I wasn't crying, but I'll entertain you. You tell me what you think was going on there. And uh, he looked me dead in the eyes and he said, you've just felt love for the first time in your life and you didn't know what to do with it. And he hit the nail on the head. That was exactly what was going on. I had felt love 
for the first time and I did not know what to do with it. The only way I could cope with it was by trying to restrain the emotion. And actually that was just not working. The emotion was too strong. The pull was too strong. And he said, you need to give this, you need to give this church thing a go. You need to give Jesus a chance to, to love you and be loved. And so I went on this journey of trying to figure out the whole church thing. You know, we went every Saturday night because I had a Saturday night gathering for, for younger hip people um, who didn't want to get up on a Sunday morning. And so I went along to the Saturday night and we were going for, well, I think it was about eight or nine months. And I was in a home church and we were studying the Bible together and I was trying to figure it all out and asking all these questions. And um, me and my partner had got engaged and so we were planning to get married. And um, I was quite confident in being able to have a conversation and engage with faith, but I wasn't truly kind of submitted to it, if you want to call it that. I really, I was still kind of a bit standoff. I was still kind of a bit, I don't want to go too deep here. I don't really want to be too vulnerable. And so my wedding day came along and um, I'm there looking all nice and wearing a suit and I've got a bit of streak of purple in my hair and because I was a bit of a rocker um, and my grandmother was there. Uh, she was, she was sat there and my grandmother had been suffering with dementia for a couple of years at this point. So um, she wasn't very well and she was quite frail and had forgotten quite a lot of her family members. But on my wedding day, she was there and I, from across the room, I just heard this random shout. She's, she's from Connethley, South Wales. She had a really thick Welsh accent and she just goes, Gareth, will you wash that purple out your hair? You look stupid. And I was just like, oh, that's my grandmother right there. The dementia for a moment was non-existent. And my grandmother was shouting at me across the room. <laughs> and there's a photo on my wedding day of me with, with my wife. And uh, she's in a wheelchair in front of us. And she, she wheeled the chair backwards and the handle caught me in the groin just as someone took a photo. So my grandmother is sat there with a big smirk on her face and I'm stood behind her like kind of scrunched over. And she wheeled herself forward and looked over her shoulder and just gave a little laugh and went, ha ha, I got you. And I was just like, amazing, amazing. And it was a great day. It was a lovely day. I felt top of the world. The next morning I'm in the hotel room and I'm having a shower, just kind of getting freshened up. And the phone went and my brother was calling my youngest brother. And um, my wife was like, you need to answer the phone, you need to answer the phone, it's really serious, you need to answer the phone. So I picked it up and I was a little bit annoyed. I'm like, look, it's my, you know, it's the day after my wedding day, please don't be ringing me, can you leave it alone? And he was in tears on the phone and he said, Gaz, Nan's dead. My grandmother had gone home that night, she'd gone to sleep and she didn't wake up. And her final day was my wedding day. And my world had gone from such a high to a very, very deep low. And I got angry and I blamed God and I blamed everybody else around me. And I became really, really distraught by this. And it was really, really hard. I found out not long afterwards that, that the woman I'd just got married to had um, been having an affair. and. She left me and I was then unemployed. I lost my job. I was depressed and I'd gone back to living in a box room. I was living in a room that was no bigger than this front room that I'm in now. And it had all of my belongings in. And I just looked up to the sky and I was like, I thought I was on the winning team. I thought you become a Christian. Everything's okay. That couldn't have been any further from the truth for me at that point. And so I distanced myself from the church. I distanced myself from the friends I had made. And I just went in. I just went in on myself, put my walls up, and tried to deal with it. And I just wasn't. Then a guy called Dave Kendall came and knocked on the door. And he was from the church. And he was a guy I would made friends with. And he pretty much just barged his way into to the shared house that I was living in. He sat me down on the couch, got me a coffee. And he said, look, mate we need to help you get your life back on track. 
God has got something for you. He is for you. Jesus is for you. Let's be honest. Crap happens. People die. Relationships end. Life happens. But Jesus doesn't want any of that for us. But we have to get through it. And by having Jesus, we can get through it better and we can get through it stronger. And we can get through it in a community of people who will care for us and love us. And we can have a deep sense of identity in something other than the people and the relationships around us and the things that may potentially hurt us. And I was like, okay, you're talking a bit of gibberish to me, but what, what do I do with this then? And so he said, let's, let's go backwards into your past. Let's deal with all of this hurt and this anger and this bitterness and this unforgiveness that you've got from all the rubbish that's happened. And let's try and get you back on track. So we went on this journey together. We, we went through this book called 12 and a half steps to spiritual health. And um, one of the steps in that is like making a real li long list and account of all the bad stuff you've done and going to people and asking them to forgive you, but then also going to all of those people who hurt you and forgiving them. So I got in touch with my mom and we had a very long discussion about my childhood. I found my dad. Um, he's now part of my life. Uh, he's I got to see him over, over Christmas of a video call and I got to see him on Father's Day so me and him restored our relationship um, I got things back on track with with my with my ex-wife um, we we hadn't divorced so we tried to give the relationship another go um, it didn't work out we did end up divorcing in the end but it was amicable and there was no there was no like bad feelings or anything we just thought you know what if this isn't going to work it isn't going to work so so we put the relationship down and I moved on. Um, and then we got stuck. We got stuck on my, my abuser um, because the last thing I knew, he was in prison. Um, and that was, you know, 15, 10 years ago, something like that. So I had no clue where to start. I asked my family if they knew where he was. No one knew where he was. It was a bit of a dead end. So I was like, well, what do I do? And Dave said, well, the first thing you can do in any situation is pray about it and I was like okay cool so um it was a very simple prayer quite a bold prayer but very simple and I just said look God <laughs> it was almost like I was giving him a demand it was like look God if you're real and I think you are and if Jesus is for me and I think he is you need to help me deal with this one with this one thing I need you to help me be able to forgive the guy who put me through so much pain and hurt and set my life off on a, on a totally different trajectory. I need you to help me forgive him. If you can do that, then I'm all in. You've got me. I'm all in. I will drop the walls. I will be vulnerable. I will, I will give you everything I've got. I will fully submit. And uh, I got myself a job. I was back working. So the next day I go into work as usual and, um, I was working at a, a CEX store. So I don't know if you know them. You see them in towns all over the country. They trade video games and stuff. So I was working in one of those stores and um, my abuser walked in and joined the queue. So I'm at work the day after this prayer and my abuser walks in and joins the queue. So at this moment, there's a lot of feelings going on. I feel like I could jump the counter, run down. I'd been doing wrestling training for about a year or so at this point. I could body slam him into the floor and make him feel what I felt. I could run away. I could take a break. I could try and avoid him. Or I could deal with it. And I could take the opportunity that God has placed in front of me to do something about it. So he starts coming down the queue. He starts coming down the queue and he's getting closer. And lo and behold, I had to serve him. I had to serve my abuser. So he gives me his empty DVD cases and we glanced at each other briefly. And I got a real sense that he was just as scared about this interaction as I was. I could see it in his eyes. He was shaking as he handed me his DVDs. I turned my back on him and got the CDs, put them in the cases, come back to the till cashed it through, he gave me his money. And as I handed him back the change, I grabbed his hand, I looked him dead in the eyes and I said, I forgive you for what you did. 
I forgive you. And as I let go of his hand, it was almost like I've been carrying an elephant on my back all my life and it had just dropped off. My chest came out, the weightlessness, I was a little bit like, whoa, whoa, what is this? And then I took a break. <laughs> then I went upstairs, I washed my face. I just was just blown away. How can I deny? How can I deny something like that? I, I could not pin this to coincidence. I could not pin this to anything other than I prayed for it. And God was like, all right, big man, there you go. Deal with it. And I, I met a promise in that prayer. I said, if you can prove to me that you're real by helping me deal with this, then I'm in. I'm all in. And from that day, I've lived by that mantra. I have lived by, I can either make excuses, walk away from Jesus or walk away from him, or I can make a move towards him. Every day when I plant my foot, it's a day for Jesus. Every conversation that I have, every platform that I'm given, every time I'm given an opportunity like this to share my story, it is not me that has done the turnaround in my life that I have seen. It has been Jesus and his love for me. That, that is it. Yes, there is some moments where I have to remind myself of that. Yes, stuff still happens. Life still throws stuff our way. But we have a responsibility, the ability to respond to whatever it is that's thrown at us. And that ability to respond, for me, is to not turn my back on Jesus, but to turn towards him and to face him in every situation that's thrown my way. From that point, I got my debts dealt with through Christians Against Poverty. I started working for them. I started running one of their centres. Every time I'm meeting someone who's been in debt, I'm able to sit alongside them as, as a friend and as someone who knows their situation because I've been there. I've been in debt. I know where they're hiding the letters. I'm able to share with them what Jesus has done in my life. When I started training to become a professional wrestler, when I was a young boy, seven or eight years old, I would get lost in the world of professional wrestling. I would see these characters and think one day I'm going to be like them. And God has given me that. He's given me that, that will of my heart to be a professional wrestler. But now I'm not just a wrestler. I'm a Christian professional wrestler. People know who I am because I wear T-shirts that say pray, eat, wrestle, repeat. They see the cross on my arm and they know that, that, you know, that, I'm, that I'm a Christian. They, they hear me quote scripture when I'm cutting a promo they see me as as a as a superhero for the kids but I'm praying with them in the entrance and I'm asking my opponents if I can pray for our match so none of us get hurt it's another platform for me to go well this isn't about me this is about Jesus cap is a platform for me to say this isn't about me yes I can help you get through the stuff and build a budget and all that kind of stuff but ultimately Jesus is the one who can pull you from this and keep you from this I've been remarried. So I met my wife at CAP. She, she worked there. Um, so I've been remarried. God has given me back that marriage that I wanted, that family that I wanted. I've got a young daughter now. Her name's Isabella. Middle name Joy because she brings joy to the world. And she's a blessing, an absolute blessing. Um, and God has just continually blessed me and blessed me and blessed me. And I believe fully that is because I've submitted and submitted and submitted and submitted time and time and time again to him and everything that he has for me. So that's my story. <laughs> um, there's obviously a lot in there that we could, we could unpack further and I'm happy to hear questions, but um, I'm just going to pass back to Alan so he can uh, cap this off and then we'll do some questions. But thank you for your time, everybody. And uh, I really hope that I've spoken to you um, and really touched your heart tonight. Thanks, Gareth. Wow. What have you been through? Amazing story of what you've gone through and how you've come through it, how God has brought you through it. But you, you're interested. You said that you had to submit. Yeah. And, and this is it. And, and God calls us to submit to him. You know, the most wonderful thing you can have is a relationship with God. He wants a relationship with you. Gareth found that relationship. It wasn't easy, but he came to that place where he found that relationship with the living God. And God wants a living relationship with you. You know, Jesus said, 
He came to die for you. He came to take the punishment that you should have taken. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all brought on God's laws and commandments. But that's why Jesus came. And as a perfect sacrifice, he submitted to his Father. He submitted totally to his Father's will. He said, if this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He submitted to the Father. So Jesus came and he died for you. And all you have to do, if you want a relationship with, with your Heavenly Father, then you have to acknowledge you're a sinner. You have to turn away from your sin, repent from your sin. That's what it means, repentance. Turn away from it. Invite Jesus to come into your heart and life by his Spirit. And he will come and he will give you the free gift of eternal life. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. It's a free gift. And God offers it to you, but it will not be yours until you receive it. And so tonight, I want to give you an opportunity that you can receive that gift of eternal life. It doesn't mean that your life is going to be perfect and easy. It doesn't mean you won't have any problems. You possibly have more problems than you had before. But you've got someone who will walk with you through those situations and bring you through. And so if you would like to receive this wonderful gift of eternal life, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now and mean it with all your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that I am a sinner because the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. And that includes me. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross in my place, taking the punishment for my sins and you poured out your precious blood to wash my sins away I repent of my sins I turn away from them I turn to you with all my heart come into my heart Lord Jesus come into my life right now by your spirit and give to me the free gift of eternal life. I receive you now. Thank you for coming into my life. Now I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And that God has raised him from the dead. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me, for making me a child of God. Help me from this day forward to follow you, to serve you, to live for you, to glorify your oh, yeah. name. And I look forward to that day when you will come again. And take me to be with you forever. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please let us know by phoning this number 07943-550-287. That is 07943-550-287. And if you have any prayer needs, you have one help, please either phone, WhatsApp, or text that number, and someone will get back to you. And so I'm going to hand over to George now, see if he's got any questions for Gareth. Thank you, Alan. I've got loads of questions, actually, Gareth. Fantastic. <laughs> First and foremost, I mean, you've told us a great, a fantastic story, and you said like, when you were about 14, you were, your mother put you out and things like that. I mean, how old are you now? I'm 33 now, so um, I'm getting on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look a day over 20, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, when you were look, when looking back on your life, you mentioned your father, your mother, your two brothers. Yeah. And you mentioned now that you, you, your father now is a part of your life. What about your mother? Is she still a part of your life as well today? Yeah, she is, yeah. Um, so it's interesting, the, the difference in relationships. So with, with my mum, she would agree with me, and she's happy for me to share this, that... Um, that relationship has always been quite rocky. 
Um, it has always been a tough one. Uh, my mum believes that she was right when when she threw me out. She believes that because there was food in the cupboards that the alcoholism wasn't a problem. Um, but uh, you know, but honestly, as a dad myself now, as a parent myself now, um, when I knew I was going to be a parent, I had to deal with all of this stuff again because I sat there thinking about my unborn daughter mm -hmm. and thinking about everything that happened to me as a kid. And I was just like, how could a parent let that happen to their child? And so I had to come back to my mum again and just be like, mum, we need to talk about this again. I, I, I really need to try and understand this and, and, and just come into it from a totally different angle and a totally different perspective. But we, we have a relationship. My, my mum, we got to see her just before Christmas and pick up some presents and she got to see my daughter. And so, so I have a relationship with her and my brother's. And my dad, um, you know, they're all different in their own way. Um, but um, yeah, my mum, it's difficult. My dad, he just he just loves being a part of my life. Um, he just loves being a part of my daughter's life. Um, he's he's amazing. He's got his got his own partner now, and he's doing really well. Um, and my brothers both got three or four kids each, and they you know they're just dealing with the madness of lockdown with a massive family. Um, but you know we, we do well. We're doing okay um, as a family. Um, none of them none of them are saved. Um, I, I'm the only Christian in the family and they, they think that, you know, they, they appreciate the, the church stuff that I do and sharing my story and sharing my faith. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe they're not mine to, uh, maybe they're not mine to, to, to seek after. Maybe somebody else will come along and, um, share with them something that touches their hearts a bit more than me, but yeah. How difficult do you find it to share your, um, your newfound faith with your family? It is hard. I think I think a lot of people who are Christians, where their family aren't Christians, it is difficult because there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of um, the relationships already quite strong, or, or actually maybe already quite damaged in some cases. Um, and I often had the phrase, "Oh, you're part of that crazy cult now," and all that kind of stuff. Um, it is hard. It, it's just hard. I think that you've got to have grace for yourself. Um, that you know, every time you share your story, you are planting seeds. You are scattering scattering the words no, nothing shared about jesus ever goes unheard um you just have to trust that god is gonna bring them to him in his own way in his own time that might be through you that might be through somebody else you never know all you can do is just be obedient and share that that's all i've ever done is just be obedient and share it's not up to me to see where that where that goes but just be obedient and share thank you for that you told us you went through a traumatic time of course with your abuser and when it, when it became public, it became even worse, you said, with the kid in school. Um, how yeah. did you deal with all that calling? I mean, because it, uh, it must have been very emotional for you at the time. Uh, yeah, so um, this is the thing. So I, I mentioned that I kind of had to learn how to fight mm -hmm. because, you know, I was only a young boy and I it wasn't a far walk from my primary school to my house, but it was on a snicket. There wasn't a lot of stuff going on. I'd have stones thrown at me. I would be tripped up. I'd be knocked into a river. Uh, I'd been kind of, you know, hit with bikes. It, it just, I just had to, I just had to learn how to fight back and defend myself. Um, and sometimes I'd leave school early. Sometimes I'd hang around and wait for everybody to go before I left. You know, I, I yeah, sometimes I'd go different routes. It was hard, man. I was only a kid, you know, only a young boy. It, what else do you do? Um, and I didn't, I didn't have any other way of dealing with it other than, you know, if they're going to punch me, I'm going to have to punch them back and, and run as fast as I can. <laughs> now, you used a very good expression there. You have to find grace for yourself. Yeah. How did you find grace for yourself and learn to love yourself through all of this that happened to you? Yeah. Um, one of the things was when I went through that 12 and a half steps, the fact that I did the step where I look at everything that was wrong with me first led me to a place where, yes, um, I, I wasn't perfect. I never have been perfect. I never will be perfect. I rub people the wrong way sometimes. I've done bad things in my life. Because I got beat up as a kid, I shouldn't have beat them back up myself. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. I, I had to learn that some of the stuff that I had justified as being okay because of what had happened to me was still not okay. And that was character stuff. That was reactionary stuff. Um, it was uh, habits things that I just picked up over time. And I technically had to just deconstruct myself and rebuild myself again as, as a follower of Jesus, but as a new man and as a guy who has dealt with his stuff. And for men, that is so hard. We don't, 
discuss our problems. We don't Amen. open up. We're not vulnerable. But when we're given an opportunity to, man, we need to take it. And as a guy who's still not perfect today, but has some wisdom, I would say to any guy who is struggling with anything whatsoever, find another guy who can help you. And if you're a guy who's got your stuff together, find another guy who you can help. Come alongside each other. You know, we call it mentoring or discipleship in, in Christian terms, but really it's just doing life together and being vulnerable with each other. And guys, we all know how important that is. We just need to start doing it. Just as you said that you said you shouldn't have hit them back again, those people. But can I just point out, you do beat people up for a living at the moment. <laughs> 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 we'll, get to the, we'll get to the wrestling in a moment. You said, yeah, sure. You know, at 14, you were put out, uh, your mother put you out into the street, of course. And you yeah. had to find it hard. And then 16, you found a hostel. Mm-hmm. And then you, you met some friends in Bradford, you said, and you went to church with them. Yeah, so that was... Um... Obviously, for time, I've kind of condensed yeah. the story. There's a time you, frame there. How did you actually uh, come to know Jesus as your personal saviour? Um, so I think, I think for me, it was the emotional response originally to, to the worship that made me realise that there was something going on that I couldn't deny. Um, and, you know, there was an opportunity not long after that, a couple of weeks after that, where they had a guest speaker in at the church And he did something similar to kind of what we've done tonight, um, where Alan uh, said the prayer. And there was a guy who did that. And he was like, if you you know, if you want to give, you know, if you really want to give this a go, you need to you need to give your life to Jesus and say this prayer. So I said the prayer um, and I got baptized shortly thereafter um, in a a river in Ilkley. um, And it was a very wet, (laughs) cold day. Um, But I, I, I went through the steps. But like I also said in my story, as much as I had said the prayer and really thought that, that I was heading in the right direction, I still hadn't fully submitted. And, and that, that, took, that took some time for me to get to that place. I would say if someone's listening today and they want to submit and they can fully submit today, then please do that. Do it sooner rather than later. But if it is going to take some time, you are going to have to go through some stuff. And Jesus maybe is knocking at your heart every point that he gets an opportunity to. Um, my grandmother was technically Jesus knocking at my heart. My Those guys at the hostel who showed up and taught us how to cook and offered me prayer, that was Jesus knocking at my heart. When I was in the worship and I was crying, that was Jesus knocking at my heart. When I decided to say yes and fully submit, then Jesus was there waiting, but he was always knocking at my heart. Um, but yeah, so it took some time. But when I was eventually ready to, um, he was he was ready and waiting for me. You mentioned your grand. She said she was a great stalwart in your life and a yeah. strong place for you. How did she react, or how did she react when you when you actually became a Christian? So um, she she was happy for me. Um, like I said, she'd been suffering with dementia for a couple of years, so um, she she'd been moved into a flat um, opposite my mum. So um, I'd go and care for her sometimes, and we would talk, and um, you know she she would talk about her faith, but. Um, at that point in her in her life um, she really wasn't really wasn't fully there um, I think it's fair to say Um, but she was happy whenever I talked about church she was happy to hear my stories Um, how much of that sunk king I I, I can't really say Um, but she was happy whenever I said and and whenever I prayed with her when I when I prayed back she would smile Um, and and so for me that was that was a very special moment whenever I got to pray with my grandmother Um, but I, I wish, I, you know, and I pray that, that she would see me now. I mean, my goodness, I'm a totally different person now. And this is, you know, 10 plus years removed from when she died. Okay. Um, yeah, I, if, I, if, I had, if I had one wish, it would be that my grandmother could come back and spend a day with me today. And I'd be, I'd be overjoyed to tell her all the things I've done and all the things that Jesus has done um, and for her to, to, to see that. But um, alas. <laughs> That's, that's, that's great. You seem to be getting your life together. Everything seems to be going very well for you. You're getting married and you've got lots of friends and everything was going hunky-dory. And all of a sudden you found yourself, shall I say, on your back flat of the canvas again. Yeah. yeah. How did you feel at that particular time? Very angry. Very, very angry. I think, um, I think I'd got it into my head that because everything was going so well and had been going well for a little while, that this this whole Christian thing had been working out for me. Um, And maybe, and I think it's maybe fair to say that my, my trust wasn't in 
my relationship with Jesus, it was in the good stuff that was happening. And so I was seeing that as a, as a reason that everything's going well, when actually my relationship with Jesus was nowhere near where it needed to be. And so when things got rough and I ended up flat on my back, um, I wasn't able to get back up again because the relationship wasn't there. Um, and I would say now, um, I can give you another short story. So before my, before my daughter was born, um, me and my wife actually suffered a miscarriage. Um, and when that happened, the, the difference in response from, from me and her versus what it would have been back then from me was instead of me going in on myself and getting angry and getting fed up and trying to, trying to figure it all out, we just worshipped. We, we sang, raise a hallelujah. Um, I sing, my, my weapon is a melody. I sing in the face of my enemies. We, we sang, that was our anthem to get us through that tough time of miscarriage. And that response was a highlight to me of how far I'd come. That my response was not to turn away from Jesus, but to turn to Jesus and to worship him and to give him praise, even in the toughest of moments. And now when my daughter's going to bed, we sing over her and we just praise God for, for the gift of, of, of a child. And I know that it's hard when you can't have kids or if you have lost a child. But how we respond to those situations is what truly tests us and truly tests our faith. Um, and I think if you can turn to Jesus in those moments um, or even if you can't, if you're not. So this is this is another thing. By being part of a church community, a church family. By being, a, by being a follower of Jesus, you're never on your own. Yes, Jesus is with you, and that's amazing, and he's never going to leave your side. But there's also a community of people around you who can be praying with you, who can be supporting you, who can be encouraging you, who can be coming alongside in those tough times. You're never, ever doing anything on your own. And that family that you create is so special and is just what I would call a cheeky bonus of becoming a Christian, is that you entered into this family of other Christians who only want to love you and help you. Um, but you got to get that relationship with Jesus right first. And that will anchor you for the toughest of storms. And how did you mend that relationship uh, from that time? Did you have somebody helping you or supporting you? Yeah. So, um, so I mentioned uh, David Kendall in my story. He, he was like a, like a, I said earlier, a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. He, I was able to ring him up and have a vent down the phone. If I was, if I was struggling with something or we would go for a beer and, and play a game of pool and just talk things out. And he would allow me to get angry. He'd let me, express my feelings and, and my, my problems and he would always come back to me with have you prayed today <laughs> have you read your bible today have you do you want me to pray for you can we can we go worship together should we listen to something should we watch something and he always he always steered me back he always steered me back and eventually i learned how to do that steering myself um, without without having him to do it for me and um you know he lives in australia now with his wife and uh, his kids we still talk even today across the world um, and we, and we share that stuff and he's, he's, he's phenomenal. He's a great guy. Um, and I, and I wish I'd had someone like him much sooner, but he came at the time he needed to come and God sent him to me when I needed him. Um, and he was there for me. Great. So you come through with it and just tell us a little bit now about you met your new wife and how that came. So, out. Yeah. So, so we, we met at work. So, um, so my, my role is kind of, I've worked at CAP for six years in their head office. So I've done a number of different roles there. But then five years ago, I stepped out to do some of the frontline work as well. So I run the debt center, the job club here Can in Bradford. Can you explain what CAP is, please? Uh, for some so CAP is uh, Christians Against Poverty. So it's a, a debt counseling charity yeah. based in Bradford. Centers all over the country. They're in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Chicago, all over the place. Um, they... Uh, they, I got a job with them because they helped me out of debt. So I wanted to give something back. So I started working with them. Um, and my, my new wife started working there and we just bumped into each other because she had a couch that she was giving away. And she knew that we're, because I was running the center, I might know someone who needs a couch. So <laughs> she, she sent me, she sent me some pictures and was like, I've got this couch if you can give it away. And, um, we were both mutual friends with someone else who worked there. And we went out for a birthday drink and got talking and uh, she was just inquisitive. She wanted to know a bit more about me. And so I said, Oh, well, this is testimony territory. So we went for a coffee and we shared our stories with each other. And then we went for a drink and a meal. And then next thing you know, we're kind of like, I hadn't realized that we were essentially having dates. <laughs> uh, she was like, yeah, this is a date. Did you not, did you not realize that? I was like, no, 
totally didn't realize this is a day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I was cheeky enough to make the first move and um, everything went swimmingly. From there, um, we got engaged, or we met in the October, was engaged by April, where we just knew that there was, there was just, you know, the old cliche, when you know, you know. Really? For us, that was true. Um, and uh, we got married the following October, um, which was, funnily enough, it was like a week after the BBC Two documentary went out to the public. So we were middle of wedding planning when that documentary landed. <laughs> we were just like, ah! <laughs> um, yeah. What's your lovely wife's name? Her name's Beth. Okay. Yeah, yeah she's um, great. You told us all about the, the story you told us about the miscarriage, but tell us about Isabella, the joy she brings you. Oh, she's she's so amazing. Herself. Yeah, so um, she so she was born on Valentine's Day, twenty nineteen. So um, yeah, half eleven at night, it nearly tipped over onto February fifteenth, and I was like, I was saying to to my wife while we were pregnant, she's either going to land on the leap year day or it's going to be Valentine's Day. And she came on Valentine's Day, and um, we really sought God about her name, and we felt that you know Isabella was a beautiful name, and Joy, we just we just joy was just what we were feeling and what we sensed and you know she's only known lockdown which is surreal now to think that she's nearly a year old um and she's grown up in lockdown so you know she she's met her grandparents briefly um she sees a lot of people over the phone she's not been to any kids classes or like nurseries or kind of tots and toddler groups and stuff like that she's missed out on actually quite a lot but at the same time she she's pulling herself up on stuff she's crawling around she's starting her first words she's eating on her own she's got a better diet now than i have ever had in my life she's having avocado and asparagus and <laughs> all this fancy food that i didn't even eat until my 30s um <laughs> and she's always smiling and she's always happy and you know we we present at church sometimes so we service lead so we do church online and and everybody's really happy when they see isabella on the, on the screen with us and um you know, we share we share about her on social media, and people feel so connected to us as a family that they that they just love her, and she's just she's a highlight to everybody, and she's she's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The boss in the house, basically. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I I live with I live with three women. I've got a female cat, my wife, and my daughter. <laughs> so um, I'm the only guy in the house. <laughs> I'm the same as you, pal. <laughs> now, of of the other things that you love in your life, you love wrestling. Yeah. You said you train. Tell us a little bit why you wanted to get into wrestling. Was it because of the fighting, or was it something you used to watch on telly? Yeah. So, um, so again, I mentioned briefly that I used to watch it when I was a kid. Um, I, I always loved the showmanship of it, the storytelling, the characters. Never so much about the violence. It really wasn't about the violence. Um, it was, it was the showmanship that attracted me. Um, and I kind of liked to think that I was living vicariously through these characters that I could escape the rubbish that was going on at home. And for a few hours I could watch wrestling and get lost with Hulk Hogan and the undertaker and stone Cold Steve Austin and the rock and Shawn Michaels and triple H and the Hardy boys and all these characters. And um, when I got into my early twenties, um, I found out about a wrestling school that was doing the training. Um, and I was like, Oh, well, actually I probably want to give that a go. So, um, so I went and started training and I picked it up really quickly. Um, I kind of learned how to do the physical stuff, but I had what they would call the intangible, which is the, the X factor where I was able to kind of do the showmanship stuff quite easily. Um, I was quite a natural at it. So I was able to bring crowds in on my matches and, and they were reacting the way I wanted them to react. And the matches were kind of peaking and troughing and the, the, the psychology was there. All I needed to learn how to do was how to do it safely. So the training was actually quite quick. Um, and then, like I said, I've been doing it 10 years now. Um, I, I tore the country doing it. Obviously, I haven't been able to do it during lockdown because you can't really socially distance while wrestling. That's, that's pretty much impossible. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I started out just just giving it a go, getting into a training school, and, and just when, I, when it happened, it just flew. And I've been running, been running my own shows more recently as part of my own ministry, um, touring churches, doing um, wrestling events <laughs> for churches. <laughs> and then and then I share my story in the middle. So um, God really challenged me one time around the platforms that we have 
um, and how we use those platforms. So being a wrestler, that's a platform. So how do I use that to, to show love of Jesus? And so my character changed, my, my whole ring style changed, everything switched up to being trying to reflect Christ as, as best I could. And then I've been running the odd show here and there for, for friends and fundraisers for cap and other stuff. And um, I realized, well, actually, if I'm running the show, I'm in charge of the content so I can pick what matches happen when, whatever happens. So I thought, well, why don't I just put my testimony smack bang in the middle so people come for the wrestling, but then they hear my story. I mean, what better way to, to tell them about Jesus? Amen. And then we have a little bit of wrestling afterwards. And so I tried it a couple of times with some churches that I knew through Cap and they were really happy with it. And next thing you know, where we were at the, the Christian Vision for Men gathering event from the two and a half thousand people, we uh, did, a church, did a church in Leeds, got 500 plus people through the door from the local community. They got to hear my story. We're all signing up for Alpha at the end um, and um, just really solid response. Uh, Bishop Philip North is a fan. He, uh, he actually slapped one of the wrestlers one time at a show for funnies. Um, and it just it's just taken off. And, you know, we were planning to have a, a bumper year this year, but again, COVID has oh, kind of put a stop to that. But hey, when, when churches open back up again and things can happen, we will be back in full swing with that. Um, really, again, just to put Jesus front and centre um, and to give him the platform that he deserves. Now, like you, I grew up watching the um, Giant Haystacks, Mick McManus. Yeah. Big Manus, classic. Yeah. <laughs> Big Daddy. And yep. we used to, I'm going to ask you a question now that everybody wants to ask. Is this it is real? It. This is the question. <laughs> Do <Yep>. people, is <laughs> it real? <laughs> okay. So um, I answer this question a lot. So I've kind of got a pre, pre-made pre answer for this question. So it depends what you mean when you say real. Often people ask the question, is it fake? Again, depends what you mean when you say fake. So I'm sorry to burst the bubble. The winner is predetermined. I'm sorry. For those of you who thought that it was real, the winner is predetermined. I'm sorry. But what is real, what you can't fake, is the slams, the falls, mm -hmm. the hits. Um, as much as you learn how to break fall, as you would in any martial art, as you would in any physical contact, you, you still, um, you're still getting hit. You're still falling five mm -hmm. to six feet at a time. You, you're still hitting wood and metal. You know, there's not very much padding on those rings. Um, the ropes are made of metal cables. When you hit them, it's like hitting a brick wall. And the, the, the spring back can, can graze you. Uh, the turnbuckles are covered in padding because it's just a metal bar that is holding the ropes tight. So when you hit a corner, if that padding wasn't there, it's pretty much, again, like being spiked in the spine. Like it is, it is rock solid. And that's why you have to train to do it. You have to learn how to do it safely. Um, all the punches and the kicks, um, there's little tricks that you can do to throw a punch, but you kind of slap your arm as you're kind of coming through right? to so get the noise. Mm -hmm. And you try not to touch and you leave your fist kind of half open, <laughs> almost like you're holding an egg so that it can collapse on impact. But accidents happen. You can still get whacked by a rogue punch. A rogue <laughs> kick might hit you. Um, the metal chairs are real. They're just real metal chairs. They're not gimmicked in any way. Right. They just hit each other with them. So you, you, you come away from a wrestling match sore and battered and hurt. But you know you're going to win <laughs> and you know you're going to lose. Um, <laughs> and the rest of the match, again, depends on the level that you're at. So the guys that you used to watch, so Mitt McManus, Cat Weasel, Johnny Saint, those guys from way back when, they, they would practice their match over and over and over again. They would do a tour of the country and they would practice the same match hold for hold, lock for lock, move for move, until they got to a venue like St. George's Hall or Wembley, and they would then put it on TV. So by the time they got to putting it on TV, they had rehearsed it in front of crowds around the country multiple times. So what you saw on TV was a very polished product. Mm -hmm. What happens these days is because the, there isn't really the, the audience for it in the UK. It's getting there. But um, when I, whenever I show up to a show, um, not when I'm running because I try to put a bit more planning in, but when I go to a show where I've been paid to come and come and wrestle, I may sometimes have a 20 minute match and have an hour to plan it. And I've never wrestled the guy before. So we show up and we do a beginning, a middle and an end. And the rest of it, you just add lib on the fly. You just kind of feel the crowd out and, and just stick, stick stuff in. You don't really plan too much. So um, it's a little bit more risky now than maybe what it was um, back then. So, um, yeah, it's fake. I'm sorry. It's not real. 
to that degree, but you still get hurt and it is still pretty rough and solid and you need to be a tough cookie to do it. You mentioned, tell us a little bit about GT Ministries, um, how that works for you. Yeah, so that, that that's the ministry I was telling you about where we tour churches, putting on shows and um, sharing my story in the, in the middle of the show. Um, so like I said, that idea was born from giving Jesus the platform through wrestling. Um, and, you know, if churches are, are excited about that, if they love the idea of that, if you're sat there going, hey, I'd love to have a show, um, just get in touch with us. Our website is gtministries.co.uk. Uh, we've got like some previous shows and stuff on there you can watch. And um, we've got a whole talent roster from all over the country. Of people. I was to say, are, there, are there other Christian uh, wrestlers that uh, go with you? Yeah, there's a few. Um, the majority of the talent I use aren't Christian, um, but that's uh, that's only because I want them to be Christians. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, come along, yeah, come we come to the show. Um, I'll, I'll get you on the show. Um, but no, we, there's a, there's a core group of us who are Christian. Uh, we have a prayer team behind the scenes, um, and my wife my wife helps out, and some of the other wrestlers and their wives help out and stuff. So um, yeah, there, there's a core group of us who are Christian. Um, and you know, whenever we're doing it at a church, we pray together as a group before the show and after. And there's a communication with the church ahead of time to promote the event, put an alpha course on, so there's something to follow up with. Um, and um, you know, or Christianity Explored, whatever their version might be. But um, yeah, they're they're great. They're amazing, fun shows. We want it to be fun, fun for all the family. Kids can come, um, but we just we just put we put Jesus in the center. Well, you've just ruined my childhood and telling me that everything they did was fake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate doing right. it, but everyone always asks me. I hate doing it. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. But, I mean, it's been fantastic talking to you, Gareth. It's been uh, really great and some great insights into your own life and how you became a Christian and into what you do at the moment. And I ask this of all, my, uh, of all the guests that we have on here. Of all the decisions that you made in your life, what do you think was the best decision you ever made? Oh, without question, to fully submit to Jesus. Without question. Because that has shaped the rest of my life. Everything that I, that I am blessed with today has been a direct result of that decision. And I continue to make that decision daily because it is the best decision you'll ever make. Um, and, you know, when the day comes, when I rise up to those pearly gates and Jesus meets me there and he's like, hey, don't punch me. I know you're a wrestler. Um, I'll be able to say, but hey, thanks, man. Like You you turn my life around. And uh, I look forward to that day. Um, Before I go, until then, where can I get one of those T-shirts? <laughs> so so uh, this T-shirt is available on the website. So if you go into gtministries.co.uk, there is a bit on there that says merch. Um, you can go on and there's, there's a bunch of different ones. I've got one that says um, uh, fearless fighter on the front. And then yeah. on the back, it says faithful follower. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we've, we've got a bunch on there. So you can go on there and find those t-shirts on there. And so everything is at gtministries.com, is it? Or code.uk. Co. 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 Yeah. It's been fantastic talking to you, Gareth. Thank you so much for your time. All the Thanks. best with you, of course. And you've got plenty of join Isabella while you're at the lockdown. <laughs> and your wife, yeah. Beth, of course. <laughs> and yeah. with that, I'll just hand back to Alan. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Gareth, for answering those questions so great and uh, it's been so great listening to you and one young man he had to leave he's going to work at three o'clock in the morning he said but he said wow. he was very inspired by it uh, Daniel Amazing. so th that is great yeah thanks for being so honest about your life and there's a few people I'd like to have a match with like George and uh, John Sellers I'd like to arrange a match set up a match with a few people a few people in BMF I think we'll, we'll arrange some matches for you I think in the coming day Oh, but thanks again, and may it may the Lord bless you uh, when it opens up again. I pray He'll bless your your work, and I pray God will open many many doors for you, and you get the opportunity to share your story and uh, see many many people come to faith in Jesus. Thanks again, Gareth, so much. Thank you, uh, George. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, can I invite you, remind you all that next Monday night we will be here again on Zoom at eight o'clock with. Uh, David Hathaway, the founder of Eurovision, who's been in ministry for 70 years and has a vision for Europe, and he'll be sharing that with you next week and sharing his life story. But tonight, if you want help, please contact us on our um, direct dedicated per hotline. I'll give you the number. It is 07 943 That is 
0793435027 you can phone whatsapp or text and someone will be in touch with you either in, immediately or very soon afterwards and they will be there to give you some advice and help and if you want to know more about the work, you can go to our website. That's bmflifestories.com. You can find out all that we're involved in. You can also watch uh, Gareth's story again on Facebook and also on YouTube. And if you go to YouTube on uh, Life Stories at Lunch, you can watch all the Monday night Zoom stories on there. And we'd encourage you to do that and tell others about it. And please subscribe on there. We want to get more subscribers. It doesn't cost you anything, but the more subscribers we have, the more work we'll be able to do. So please do that. And at lunchtime, we also have live stories at lunch, a short uh, testimony goes out every lunchtime at live stories at lunch. So please join us at one of these events and please come again next Monday and hear David Hathaway's story. May God bless you all. And thanks again, Gareth. Thanks, George. Thank you, Howard. God bless you. May you have a wonderful week. In spite of all that's going here, um, Jesus is alive. And he's promised if you put your trust in him, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Amen. God bless you all. Good night.